Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to do something uh, that may be kind of boring to some people, but you know, some people like these kinds of videos. I am going to be replacing the Drive Rack PX in my rack. So let's uh, get spun around here and we'll get started. Before that, if you guys haven't already subscribed, please subscribe to the channel. I really appreciate it. I don't put out a ton of videos, so I'm not going to flood your feed with all kinds of stuff. But uh, if you do like my content, I would appreciate the subscription. So let's get started in. All right, so let's tear into this a little bit here. So as you guys know, I think this is the right side, yeah. As you guys know, my main this is my main rack that I use for most of my mobile DJing. Um, so I have multiple different racks I use for multiple different things. This one is my base rack that I use uh, during my weddings, um, during you know school dances and things like that. Stuff that I don't have, uh, you know, if I don't have the need for a big old amp rack to have out there, I'm just gonna take this. So what's in this right now is my Drive Rack PX and then the uh, Behringer NU6000. So we'll zoom in here just a little bit so you can see a little bit better. I'm not gonna power it up right now, but if you can see there, it could be kind of dark. But yeah, I have a Drive Rack PX. This Drive Rack PX has two inputs, a left-right input, and then it has two main outputs and then to subwoofer outputs. Um, and of course it has electronic crossovers, it has uh, parametric EQ on both outputs, it also has parametric EQ on the input, it has uh, compression, limiting, subharmonic synthesis, some other things as well. It's also got the RTA. Um, the disadvantage to this unit is that I can't control anything remotely. I have to control everything right here on the front panel, so I have to use the knob and the buttons and stuff like that, which isn't bad, but you'll, I, I found I come into some instances where I have this thing, the whole rack, you know, sitting remotely because I'll have the main outputs from my mixer here. I just have two XLRs. So what I'll do is I'll just run those two XLRs a long distance and put this thing close to where the speakers are at and close to where the subs are at. That way it, it shortens my uh, signal cables coming from here shortens my sub cable and stuff like that. And usually I'll have the better, you know, more power options by hiding this thing behind a curtain or something like that, you know. So uh, let's spin this around real quick. We'll take a look at the back and I'll show you a little bit how that's hooked up. All right, so here on the back, we have uh, everything sealed up. So it's all nice and clean, no wires coming in or out. Um, we have our power con input here, which is a standard power con cable that powers everything in the rack and it also puts power to this distribution bus down here. Um, and then I have a left right input here and I just use Sharpie because it's all I had at the time. Left right input, I have both of my subwoofer outputs. So these are uh, the twist lock, Nutric uh, twist lock connectors for the subwoofer outputs. These are hooked directly to the amplifier. So these are high level subwoofer outputs for powered or for unpowered subs here. Then over here I have my left right output which is just the looped output through the uh, drive rack and then I have an additional output here which is I have an S beside. This is the other side of the subwoofer output. So I run my subwoofers mono. Uh, most people do. Um, so the signal that comes in is pulled off of the left channel and then it goes to both channels of the subwoofer amp. So the left, the left subwoofer out, I guess you would say, goes to the big subwoofer, or the NU6000 in there, and that's what comes out on these two things here. So these are what I hook my LS1802s up to, and uh, it just takes off to the left side. The other side, which they're summed mono in the processor, but the other side goes to this connector here. So if I have a powered sub, which I, I have now, but if I have a, have a gig where I'm just using a powered sub, I'll use uh, this little link here, that way I can still use my drive rack. So yeah, this, uh, this power distribution bus on the bottom here gives me uh, voltage of what I'm plugged into and it gives me amp draw from all these outlets here. So usually what I'll do is I'll just have one thing plugged into the wall when I get to a gig and it's gonna be this thing. So I'll plug this thing into the wall and then I will plug all of my stuff like my mixer, um, my speakers, my ZLX 12Ps, I'll plug these in here. Um, anything else that I have, I plug all into here. <clears throat> because number one, this is all surge suppression. Uh, well, surge suppressed, I'm gonna say it that way. Um, and then uh, I can see with the ammeter that's on the bottom here exactly how much current I'm pulling from all of my accessories, from my mixer, from my speakers, everything. I can see how much I'm pulling. So I know 
if I'm getting kind of close down here to 15 amps or something like that, I'm going to need to start splitting stuff out because that's a lot of current to be pulling through a little power distribution here. Typical gig, while I'm running, I'm pulling like three to seven amps, I would say. So I'm not pulling a ton of power. I'm not using, you know, even with the sub amp running, seven amps is usually about average what I'm pulling. It may peak a little bit higher than that every now and then when I'm really, really running everything hard and I got a lot of stuff plugged in, but that's the most. These uh, power cons are rated for 20 amps. Most of your uh, household or most of your commercial so, uh, regular Edison plug sockets are on 20 amp breakers and stuff like that. So you still gotta be mindful of it. I still never try to exceed 15. It's a good safety point. And uh, if I do, then I need to start splitting things out to different circuits in the thing. So, all right, well, let's uh, go back to the front. We'll pull out that drive rack and then we're gonna do a couple other little things in there um, because this drive rack PA2 has network capability. So let's get started on that. All right, so now there's two things we have to put back in this box. One of which is the new drive rack. The second of which is a wireless router. The purpose of that is the drive rack PA2 has app control, and I've talked about this in my drive rack PA2 video, but uh, it has network control, so we want to make sure that we can control this thing remotely. So if we're in the middle of a gig and we need to make some adjustments for something, we can do that. So I guess you can call this kind of a drive rack PA2 unboxing. I've opened it up before just to make sure everything was good. But we have a basic power cable. I'm going to use the same cable that was in the rack already, so I'm not going to use this one. It's just easier than to pull it all apart. Um, and then we have the drive rack PA2. So I think if I were to guess, it's a little bit smaller and lighter than the PX, but I don't know. Just my opinion. Drive rack PA2 itself. There it is. Beautiful. Brand new. I'm going to leave the plastic on the front of these just for now. So one thing that I'm not going to be able to utilize on this PA2 is the mid outputs. So one thing I had considered was putting the mid outputs, one of those, to that uh, rear connection on this rack and then the other two low connections to my amp. But I would rather have the same signal. If I need to use the mid output for whatever reason, um, you can use the mid output for a delay speaker or if you have a cardioid subwoofer array you're doing, you can flip the phase and time align on that mid output as long as you have the uh, EQ curves the same on the low output. So you can do that. Um, if I'm doing any kind of cardioid arrays, I'm probably not going to be doing it with this rack. I'm going to be doing it with my big rack that has the PA2 that I can get to everything on the back of it in. So this mainly, the reason I'm upgrading this primarily is for the network control. So I can adjust parameters on this thing from my phone at a gig, easier to tune things in. I don't have to sit there and, you know, fiddle with the front of this thing. And uh, I want to be able to, to make these changes without having to go back and forth from my listening point to behind a curtain or wherever I end up sticking this rack. So that's the main purpose behind that. So let's get this thing put in here and we'll get started. Okay, there we go. We got her all hooked up here. And uh, so now we have to put our router in here. And what we have here is just a little Asus router. Um, nothing too fancy, really. This is a RTN12, just a wireless N. I don't need anything really fancy for this because this is just a uh, basic control. I'm not like streaming, you know, movies or music over this thing, so. We're gonna slide this thing in the back underneath this blank panel and we'll get it hooked up. All right, everything's been slid in. So now what we're gonna do is before we button it up completely, let's go ahead and plug it in and uh, make sure everything's gonna work for us. So I just have my power con cable here and we're just gonna plug this guy in and see what happens. All right, in the back, my power distro came on. And up here, it looks like we have some business. And zoom in a little bit here on this guy. After I drop the camera. That's not good. There we go. Of course, it's just on the default right now. Everything looks good. All right. Let's get this thing, check the network settings on this. 
and then uh, we'll get connected to it with the phone here. The system info gives us the IP address. So in this case, it's 1.26. Now, if I connect to this with my phone, search for the device, and there it is. It shows up there. We'll connect to it. Ta-da. All right. So we can look here on the front of the drive rack and see everything kind of corresponds. Um, I, can, I can adjust the mutes here. I hope you could see it, wouldn't it? I can adjust the mutes. I can do them all right here. You see they change there on the drive rack as well. So whether or not things are muted. And of course the app follows you know, whatever you hit up here too. You can see the little red lights lighting up on the bottom of my screen there. So there we have full control of this. So I'm going to load a preset. I don't know what preset I'm going to load yet. Um, I have presets saved off of my other drive rack, but what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to end up making, making my own preset for this. And that way, see me, not that you care to see me. Um, but I'm going to make my own preset for this. Uh, once I have like everything hooked up with it, I'm gonna get like kind of a baseline, you know, uh, preset started here. I'm gonna find one of them here and uh, just get one that I think looks right, and then start with that. And then once I'm there and I have my equipment and stuff set up, I'll go and then I'll tune and get things exactly how I want it. So I'm gonna pick a uh, a new uh, setting here. I'm just gonna load this. You can see starting from new settings. Oh, you can. I can. It says starting from new settings. And then it's gonna ask me questions right here on the front of the uh, drive rack. So as I go through this initial setup, it's gonna ask you know, what kind of configuration you're doing. You're doing a mono configuration, stereo configuration. And all these questions are being asked as well on the app. Not that my camera's gonna focus, but they're asking the same questions the app. So you can go through the app and uh, set all this stuff up um, just as easy. So like as I continue on there, um, it's asking if I'm doing stereo linked or dual mono, and I'm just going to hit, you can see it change there, hit next, now it's going to, you select your main speaker brand, and I don't know, I don't think they have the uh, ZLX12Ps, but I'm going to put not listed. Yeah, they don't have them in there, so you select the main speaker, I'm going to choose not listed. It is going to be a passive speaker. I am using subs. Yes, I am using subs. And I'm just going to pick a, uh, a generic subwoofer as well, because they don't have the carbon subs in here that I use. And then, we're not listed, that's fine. And it's going to ask me to make it to match my levels. I'm not going to do that now. I just kind of want to get everything in here, and then I'll kind of default it all out. So there we go. Um, that's pretty much it. That's kind of all I was really wanting to cover with this video. Uh, just a basic, you know, setup of this thing. I'll probably take this thing out and uh, set it up here probably tomorrow. I have a gig coming up tomorrow. I'm going to go through it and get it all set up. I'll probably bring the RTA mic. We'll hook the RTA mic up. And you can do that all on the app as well, and I've shared this in the PA2 video. But So now I have a rack with a subwoofer amplifier in it and a drive rack PA2 that I can control completely remotely. So if I need to adjust the sub-level, I don't have to actually walk up to the uh, uh, wherever this rack's at, if it's you know, somewhere it's inaccessible, and adjust this, and the volumes on the front of the amp, or the drive rack. I don't have to do that. I can just do it all from my phone now. So it's going to help smooth things out a little bit. You know, I definitely recommend drive racks and any kind of active crossover network, especially if you're running powered speakers. I mean, in honesty, for weddings and stuff like that, most people are. Passives aren't quite as popular anymore because it's just an additional step, additional piece of the puzzle. Um, I still run passive subs for a reason. It's modularity, the reason for me. Um, but I have powered sub as well. And passive subs can be a little bit, little bit cheaper, but you have to have amps then. So, you know, there's, there's the whole give and take on that. But even if you're running passive subs, you have an amplifier just like this, I still recommend using some sort of crossover. Because if you don't, you, know, you can watch the video I did on the PA2, which I'll try to link it above here. But if you don't, then you can run into some real sound quality issues. And uh, this will help clean your stuff up like you've never imagined. There is a learning curve to getting these going. 
um, that's the big disadvantage of these is there's complexity here. It's not just plug a speaker into your mixer and be done. You have another step of the process here. You have to set this stuff up. But once you do, and once you hear how good your stuff can sound, whenever you're feeding the pieces of your sound system, the proper things they should be fed, and then, you know, doing little notches here where you have some uh, resonance on your speakers and things like that, you know, just smoothing everything out. Really, just take the quality of the audio that you guys have really up there. It takes it up. All right, that's enough. I appreciate you guys watching. If you made it this far, I really appreciate you. I mean, I just it doesn't do anything fancy here, but I know I wanted to kind of record another video. I got to try to keep videos going because apparently some of you guys enjoy this stuff. Um, any suggestions for videos, let me know. I appreciate those. Those really help me pick, you know, what all you guys want to see. And uh, other than that, thank you so much. I appreciate your subscription. If you haven't already subscribed, please do. And we'll catch you on the next video. Thanks.